They say to expect the unexpected, especially in March. I guess they were right. Welcome back to Penn State Sports Night. I'm Juan Mendez alongside Zach Gershman and Andrew Kalb. After a significant amount of unforeseen matchups took place in the Elite Eight and the Final Four, the national championship game came down to two number one seeds in Gonzaga and in Baylor. This contest had a lot of expectations from both sides, but only one of them delivered when it mattered most. Zach, I'll start with you. What are your biggest takeaways from this game? Well, first off, Juan, you're right. The amount of surprises that we had in this past March Madness, March Madness tournament was definitely through the roof, but this game between Baylor and Gonzaga really was not a surprise to me. What was a surprise, though, was Baylor's tempo and how they started off the game. You could tell right away that it was Baylor's game and that they felt it, that they knew that they were going to win the national championship. I know me and a bunch of the other people that were watching the game were like, when, they, when Gonzaga called their first time out, it was like a jaw-dropping experience because of the amount of tempo that they had. And once they went to halftime with the lead and the energy, that's when it was going to be Baylor's game. Yeah, you know, after getting a week to soak in the game in its entirety, I think it's even more clear that Baylor was the better team all, all game long, pretty much. You know, they had Gonzaga on the ropes from the tip-off, the first team to lead wire to wire since UConn in 2014 in a national championship game. Gonzaga just had no answers for them. They let them shoot 40% from three. They let Jared Butler and Macy O.T. combine for 41 points. You're just not going to win like that. In my opinion, no team in the entire country would have competed with Baylor that night. And it's finally good to see Scott Drew get the national championship he deserves, completing what I think is the best rebuild in college basketball history, only winning 21 games combined in his first three seasons with Baylor, and finally winning a national championship is just something that you probably will never see again. There were far less regular season games due to COVID pauses across many programs, which made tournament seeding perhaps more difficult than usual. But there were still some lower seeded teams who shocked the world. Which Cinderella team do you, uh, surprised you the most? And which top tier team was the most disappointing? Yeah, in my opinion, I think UCLA was criminally underseeded. They went from the first four to the final four, being the first team to do so since VCU in 2011. But this team, they just showed that they can compete with the top teams in the country, beating Alabama, beating Michigan, losing on a buzzer beat to Gonzaga, a heartbreaker loss like that. You know, that's about as good as a loss as you can get for a team like this. But this is not the last thing we're going to see from UCLA. This is just the beginning of the Mick Cronin era in LA. And they can return their whole starting lineup, most of their roster. So I expect many more deep runs from this Bruins team in years to come. Yeah, the shoe definitely fit for this Cinderella story, going from the first four. Honestly, I was surprised to, to see the type of success. I thought Michigan State was even going to beat them in the first four, and then to see them being one shot away from playing in the national championship game and them playing against Gonzaga and arguably the best March Madness game in recent history. So that's definitely something that I can understand with, uh, with the number one surprise. But the number one disappointing thing for me had to be Texas. This team really for the last four for the last four march madness tournaments that they've been in a four first round exits avalon christian there was nobody thought that they were going to advance in this game i had texas winning the tournament and i was really disappointed i mean listen this is a team that they they came in going from the big 12 championship winning that to being a first round exit and it's not something i think people really expected especially from shaka smart even though now he's going to be heading out of Texas, he's going to be leaving Austin, going to Marquette. Chris Beard from Texas Tech is going to be jumping ship now to join Texas, but they had to be the number one disappointing team in the tournament. Let's be honest, not every player is built for this stage, but every year there's always a select few who really show out. Zach, you first. Who was the best player in this year's March Madness? I would have to say this Cinderella story would not be possible here without Johnny J, Johnny Juzang. The Kentucky transfer led the entire March Madness tournament in total points, beating out Timmy, beating out Jalen Suggs and all the other Baylor guys and all the other Gonzaga guys. Was the only player on the all-tournament team that was not a part of those two teams. Averaged 23 points and really led UCLA from the first four to the final four. And now the spotlight's going to be on him. You know, Juzang, he had a really impressive tournament. I think it was a complete mess up from Calipari to let him go from Kentucky, found his way to UCLA. But I think my most impressive player that I saw in this tournament had to be Davion Mitchell. When talking about Baylor, everyone wants to talk about Jared Butler, but what Mitchell brings to the table is far more impressive. He scored in double figures in every game this tournament while also averaging six assists. Not only does he get it done on offense, but on defense, he's Baylor's go-to guy when they need to shut down someone on defense. He, he averaged two steals and a block in every game this tournament, and that may not seem like a lot, but in a low-scoring game, that one steal, that two steal, that block can really go a long way at getting your team a championship like he did. If it wasn't for him, I don't think Baylor comes close to a national championship. 
Next year's NCAA tournament could look much different than this year's as the world continues to fight against the coronavirus. While it might be early, what are some predictions you guys might have for next season? You know, in my opinion, I got to say, all aboard the must bus. Let's go, Arkansas. They made it all the way to the Elite Eight this year as it's only Musselman's second season with the Razorbacks. That's just something that you don't usually see. From a program like Arkansas, they were good in the 90s, but now, you know, you're not usually seeing Arkansas in the tournament. Getting to the Elite Eight and it only a second season, I think that they can take a huge step next season. He uses a transfer portal, be portal better than any coach in the entire country. He's losing a few good players to the NBA draft, but he has already gotten some good replacements, and I can see him getting a few more. I think if all goes according to Musselman's plan, I can see the Razorbacks cutting down the nets next year. And a lot of other SEC teams are also following suit with going to the transfer portal and really taking advantage of that. Florida just got another uh, recruit in the transfer portal. They picked up Myron Jones right here from Penn State and they're trying to follow in Musclebacks footsteps and the, and the Arkansas Razorbacks footsteps as well. But the team that's going to be the number one team and the number one headline heading into the tournament next year is going to be Syracuse, led by Buddy Buckets himself, Buddy Bayheim. This team always is flying under the radar throughout the regular season. And then once March Madness comes, you can't ever sleep on Jim Beheim and his orange squad. They also have a, they also have a five-star recruit coming in, small forward Benny Williams from IMG. They're going to be a really interesting team throughout the regular season. I see them breaking the top 25 and being ranked throughout the season. But they're going to be making the final four. And don't be surprised if you see the orange lifting up the title come April. This year's tournament was one to remember, but there is lots to look forward to as new recruits and returning squads step onto the courts ready for another season. That's all we have for this edition of Penn State Sports Night. For Zach Gershman and Andrew Cobb, I'm Juan Mendez. Thank you for watching and have a great night. Thank you for watching this edition of Penn State Sports Night. If you're a fan of our content, please be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more clips. Also, follow us on Twitter at PSSN TV and on Instagram at PSU Sports Night to keep up with all the action. For all my colleagues, we are Penn State Sports Night.